Hi, this is Kevin from the Matsaurus, and in this video we're looking at questions 11 to 15 of paper 2 of the Tamura exam from 2019. All of the uh, answers to both papers 1 and 2 I'm putting in a playlist that I'll link below. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and put the bell notification on if you want to know when I'm putting the final part of this video out. So in question 11 we've got an arithmetic series with n terms, all of which are integers, and the sum of the series is 20, and we want to know which of the following statements uh, must be true. Uh, so uh, you, you might start here by thinking about the formula for the sum of an arithmetic series, it's just n over 2 times the first term plus the last term, or equivalently n over 2, 2a plus n minus 1d. Um, and so what we need here is for this to be 20. Uh, now, um, it says all of the terms have to be integers, so uh, one thing we'd notice here is that that means that, you know, for example in this first one I could rewrite it as n times a plus l is 40, so the length of these series is going to have to be multiple, uh, going to have to be factors of 40, because a plus l is going to be an integer and n is going to be an integer. Um, now actually when you look at the things that you're asked though, you might also think, well what if I just try and find some counterexamples, right? And I'll just I'll just then try to prove the ones that don't have easy counterexamples, right? So does the first term of the series have to be even? Well, uh, fairly easy to find an example that's not here, right? I could just take two terms in my arithmetic series, so just like 9 and 11 would do it. That's an arithmetic series, um, but the first term is not even, so this one definitely doesn't have to be true. Um, does the number of terms have to be even? Well, uh, no, uh, you could just take uh, the arithmetic series 20, it's only got one term, and uh, still an arithmetic series uh, that's got n terms, so it's, so it's a counterexample here. Um, and interestingly, I think you could probably take this as the counterexample for 3 as well, that says the common difference is even, right? So I could take an arithmetic series with first term 20, but only one term, and then actually it doesn't really matter what the common difference is, right? If I took the common difference for this one to be 3, well it's only got one term, so it's still just the term 20. If you're not comfortable with that, you might try to look for a slightly longer sequence. Uh, so like again, e even for this n is even 1, okay, the next uh, factor of 40 um, that's not even is 5, so I might look for something that's 5 terms long. 20 divided by 5 is 4, so if I made 4 the middle term, uh, and then I could have 5, 6, 2 and 3, that's also going to add up to 20. And actually this is also a counterexample sort of to both 2 and 3, so it shows that neither of these have to be true. We've got an odd number of terms, and the common difference is 1 here, which is odd. Okay, so uh, in question 12, most students in a large, large college study mathematics. A teacher chooses three different students at random, one after the other. Consider these three possibilities, and we want to basically write these probabilities in order, which is the lowest and which is the highest. Um, so you could you know, uh, you know, assign some numbers and try to actually work out some probabilities here, but we shouldn't need to do that. Because if you think about it, so we've got at least one of the students chosen studies maths, the second student chosen studies maths, and all three of the students chosen study maths, right? So if you sort of think of this in a sort of Venn diagram of all possibilities or something, right? Um, the second, so we've got at least one of the students studies maths, uh, R might be this sort of set here, and the second student chosen studies maths, well, if the second student chosen studies maths, then that does mean at least one of them studies maths. So so S is like a subset of R here, right? So every time the second student chosen studies maths, it must be that also at least one of the students studies maths. And if all three of the students chosen study maths, well, then it must be that the second one studies maths. So actually T here has to be a subset of S. So, uh, so the probability um, uh, t has to be the smallest probability, and then um, and then s is going to be the next, and then r is going to be the next. Right? If they weren't literally subsets of each other, I'd have to think a bit more carefully. But um, no, no issue uh, at all here. So we've got that the answer is uh, f. In question 13, it says a student approximates, approximates this integral, the integral between a and b of sine squared x using the trapezium rule with four strips, and uh, and we get an overestimate for the approximation, and uh, we want to say what, which of the following are necessarily true. So firstly, if they approximate this integral, so with the limits minus b and a, but still sine squared, well, uh, let's think about what the graph of sine squared looks like roughly. 
um, it's going to be something like this. So it's, it's going to sort of still go between 0 and 1, but where sine would go negative here, uh, sine squared is going to just be positive again. Um, and uh, and it's an even function here, so it's the same uh, on the left and the right. Okay, so, um, so the fact that it is the same left and right means that wherever I took my a and b here, I would get exactly the same you know, integral if I went from, uh, you know, minus b to minus a here, right? So regardless of whether I get an underestimate or an overestimate for the trapezium rule for the parts of the integral that I choose, I get exactly the same integral, exactly the same values of the function at a and minus a and at b and minus b. So the trapezium rule must do the same thing for both, in both integrals and the integrals must be the same. So this one definitely is true. We're still going to get an overestimate if we got an overestimate before. And in for two, what about cos squared of x? Well, again, you could try thinking about the graph of cos squared of x and re and you know and sort of comparing uh, what happens. But I think here I prefer just to use the identity sine squared x plus cos squared x equals one here, and to write this integral then of cos squared of x dx between a and b as the integral of one minus sine squared x dx between a and b, so that's just the integral between a and b of 1 minus the integral between a and b of sine squared of x dx, so this first integral is just b minus a, and then I'm subtracting the integral between a and b of sine squared of x dx. So the question is, if I got an uh, overestimate for this integral sine squared of x using the trapezium rule, and I'm looking at exactly the same points uh, for you know a and b here, well there's no over or underestimate involved here. This is exact. Uh, the trapezium rule isn't going to. It's not going to matter if I just um, you know shift the function up by one. Um, but if I was overestimating for the uh, for the trapezium rule here before and I'm subtracting it, I'm going to end up getting an underestimate because I'll get an uh, I'll get a more negative value, so it'll become an underestimate. Um, if we're at all worried about like this shift up by one crossing the axis, remember we're only dealing with uh, sine squared and cos squared are both going to be purely positive functions here, so that is just going to shift it up the page by one. Um, so, uh, so it is also the case that the uh, that this one is necessarily true, and um, and so we get the answer here D, both one and two. Right, question 14, it says, consider the following statements about a polynomial P of X, where A is less than B. Um, and it says, which of the statements is a necessary condition for P of X to be increasing for A less than X less than B? And um, so, well, uh, one is pretty, uh, pretty obviously uh, necessary, right? If the function is increasing, um, doesn't have to be strictly increasing necessarily here. That's why we've got less than or equal to's everywhere. But if this is my value A and this is B, and then if it's going to be increasing, well, P of B certainly can't be uh, below P of A, so sure, that one has to be true. But do we have to have that the gradient at A is less than the gradient at B? Uh, well, um, don't think it's too hard to come up with uh, examples where that's not the case. I mean, you could just imagine any polynomial that does something like this. It's still an increasing function, but here, you know, P prime of A is larger, the gradient here is a larger positive number than it would be here, so you can pretty confidently say that one's not true, and you can, okay, if you, you, you've got to make sure you can do it with a polynomial, obviously, but this could easily just be a part of a quadratic function or something. Um, for the third part, it's a bit less obvious to talk about the second derivative, um, but I think what I'll do is, let's just, um, Let's just get rid of that so I can draw a bit more. So we've said that one has to be true, this one not. So let's think about like a generic uh, cubic function, right? And, and think about the, so if this is f of x and I had f primed of x, right? So the derivative here has, so let's, let's, put, let's put this as the zero line. Um, so it's got two turning points here where the derivative's zero and it's increasing here, decreasing here, increasing here. So, and we know the derivative of a cubic is a quadratic, so the graph looks something like this. And then f double prime of x here. Again, this one's got a turning point in the middle here. And uh, so, and, and the gradient goes from negative to positive, right? So actually this particular cubic isn't going to help us here because 
the second derivative here is positive everywhere. It is increasing on, on any region. If I went from A to B, well, the second derivative does increase. It doesn't mean it necessarily does right, on every interval. So I'm looking for, a, I'm, try, I'm trying to actually break this and to find a point where this isn't true. Okay, so just imagine if I drew this whole thing the other way around. Forgive me for just um, drawing on top of this, but imagine if it was a negative cubic instead, like a minus x cubed plus something or other, right? Then this picture is just going to be reversed, right? This is going to be a, a quadratic that's this way up, but still has its zeros here and here, and this is going to be a negative uh, straight line. So actually, you can see pretty clearly now that I can find intervals, right, like where this original cubic is increasing. I just have to find any place where it's increasing. So it's possible to just take two points here as my a and b, where the original function is increasing. But between any two points, the uh, second derivative is decreasing. So that means that three doesn't have to be true. And the answer here is that it's just a one. Um, one only is the uh, the only one that's necessary for it to be an increasing function between a and b. And in 15, we've got the numbers a, b, and c all greater than 1, um, and it says the following logarithms are all to the same base, and what is the base? Uh, now, this, is def this idea has definitely come up in uh, math questions before, uh, where you have these log statements, and actually the idea is that you want to just um, rewrite them as simultaneous equations using the log rules. Okay, so like the first one here, becomes log of a plus 2 log of b plus log of c equals 7, right? If you don't know, if, you, if it's not clear why that's true, go back and revise logarithms, but it's just the standard rules of logs. So if I introduce some variables here, so let's just make a log a, b, capital B log b, and capital C log c, I'm never going to write an equation with both a small c and a capital C in it, so don't worry about them getting confused. Um, so this equation just becomes a plus 2b plus c equals 7, and the second one becomes 2a plus b plus 2c equals 11, and the next one becomes 2a plus 2b plus 3c equals 15. And I've got three equations now that simultaneously for three unknowns. So if you've got as many equations as unknowns, as long as they're not just sort of multiples of each other, um, it's, you know, you, you, you'll be able to find solutions. So I think I can solve for A, B, and C in this system. Um, so uh, just a question of how. Now, the sort of standard method here, um, you know, unless you want to, unless you've learned some much harder maths, is that you would take two, a pair, if you've got three equations, take a pair of them, eliminate one of the variables, so like eliminate C or something from these two, um, and then uh, take uh, these two and eliminate c from those. Then you'd get a pair of equations with a and you get two. You get a pair of two equations, each that just have a and b in them, right? Right. So we're going to eliminate c from these f first two equations. Uh, so uh, to do that, I'm just going to multiply the first one by two, and I get two a plus four b plus two c equals fourteen. And then the second one, I've got just. 2a plus b plus 2c equals 11. And you notice here we've been a little bit lucky because actually we're able to eliminate both a and c here at the same time. Because when I subtract the second one from the first, the a's and the c's will cancel and I just get 3b equals 3. Uh, so watch out for that again. If you've got three equations, perhaps they've given you some nice ones where uh, you can find a pair like that that works. Um, anyway, that means that b equals 1. And then if we go back and think about uh, what capital B is, that means 1 is the logarithm of B, right? So actually the only way that can be the case is if the base of the logarithm is B, right? Log B of B is 1, and so the answer to this question is that the base of the logarithm is B, and we don't have to go any further, right? You could continue to solve these equations if you wanted to, and I think you find that uh, A is 2 and C is 3, which also means that um, so so two so so log to the base b of a is then two so that means that sort of that the a is uh, b squared and similarly the c is b cubed but we don't have to uh, worry about uh, that here we've we've got the answer already so I hope that was useful please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and watch out for the final part of this uh, series that will be coming very soon. <laughs>